Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session in this series of American English Live Teacher Development Webinars. My name is Kate, as many of you know, and I am very happy, as always, to be your host and facilitator today. Thanks so much for joining. I'll be working today with my colleagues behind the scenes, Heather and Abigail, who will be serving as moderators to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. I'll be talking today with our presenter, Julie Vorholt, about strategies and activities that teachers can use to develop speaking fluency and accuracy in multi-level classes with students of all ages. As we start, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to our first time viewers, and it's wonderful to see those of you who've been with us for many webinars as well. Let's begin with this fantastic collage featuring teachers around the world participating in American English Live events. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development, either with viewing groups or by putting some of our strategies into practice. So please share your photos by emailing them to AmericanEnglishWebinars at FHI360.org. We'd love to see them and we'd really love to feature them in the next session, which is going to be in January. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Today is our last session in series six. Which has been the most interesting or beneficial session for you? Share your responses in the chat. We hope that you're able to use all of the practical ideas we've shared during this series in your classrooms. And as a reminder, here's a little bit about what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English Massive Open online course or a Teacher's Corner theme on the American English website. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts, questions, comments, ideas, concerns, experiences. We'd love to hear that during the session. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Please click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly, and once you've successfully done so, you can expect to receive your digital badge via email within about a week. We are thrilled to announce that the American English Live Series 7 is going to begin on January 15th, 2020, with sessions running until March 25th. We have a terrific professional development lineup lineup planned for you, which focuses on TESOL methods, curriculum design and course development, and teachers working together. So we hope to see you here on January 15th. And if you'd like to receive reminders via email and register also to get uh, resources and discussion questions, please register at the link on the slide and that we're also putting in the chat box and comment section. And now for today's session, student-centered speaking activities to increase fluency and accuracy. This webinar focuses on activities that participants can use in teaching speaking in multi-level classes with students of all ages. During this presentation, you will receive step-by-step -st step -step instructions for each activity so that you're prepared to use each idea with confidence in your classroom. And each speaking activity will include options for teaching different types of students with some modification. Each activity can be reused multiple times during a language course. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Julie Borholt. Julie currently teaches adults in the intensive English program at Lewis and Clark College in Oregon and works as an educational consultant as well. She's been a U.S. Department of State English Language Specialist in Kazakhstan and has also worked with English language teachers and students in China, Turkey, and throughout the United States. She recently edited one of my favorite teaching resource books, which is called New Ways in Teaching Speaking, 
Um, and she added over 100 new activities. Very exciting. She holds a Master's of Arts degree in TESOL from Middlebury Institute of International Studies and a Bachelor of Science in English and Secondary Education from Kent State University. So welcome, Julie. It's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for being here. Hi, Kate. Thanks for the warm welcome. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you, and it's truly an honor to connect with you and my colleagues around the world. So let's begin. Sounds good. Right now, I'm in Portland, Oregon on my campus. I teach English to adults from many countries. You'll see some of them today in my pictures. And to my students, thank you for your support. The map also shows Cincinnati, Ohio, my hometown. Maybe you can hear some regional influences in my speaking today. I know that many of you have just logged in and said hi, so hello to you too. It's wonderful to be connected. Let's begin. We're all teachers, but we're teaching in many different contexts with different topics. For a moment, think about your individual teaching situations and think about your students. When are they speaking during longer speaking activities? Examples could be talking with other students while working on projects, presenting, debating, uh, and so on, but not just speaking by giving a simple one word answer. Here's a question for you. Think about your class during the average week. What percentage of class time is spent on extended speaking activities, activities in which students focus on communicating ideas more than grammar. Is it 5%, 10% more? I'd love to hear from you. All right, what do you think everybody? How much of your class time is spent on extended speaking activities? So let us know in the comments or chat box. Let's see, I see from Ed Simon, that it's about 30 minutes of his class. Great. Atta says 15%. Let's see, what other ideas do you have? How much? Monica says 60 or 70% of my classes. Giovanni, 25%. So yeah, I think what sounds like across the spectrum of percentages of class time, Julie, is what it looks like. 60, between 15% and 70% we've seen from our audience. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Thanks, everybody. That's a big range. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to uh, learn about your classrooms. So now let's continue by looking at today's goals. We have three. We're going to define terms that are related to student-centered speaking activities. We'll examine step-by-step -step instructions for student-centered speaking activities to increase fluency and accuracy. And finally, we'll consider options for teaching these activities to different types of students. Let's move on by describing two different approaches to classrooms. The major difference between these approaches is their focus. A teacher-centered classroom strongly focuses on the teacher and the teacher's ideas. This is a more traditional style. In contrast, a student-centered classroom focuses on the students and their participation. They're more actively involved in the learning process. Let's look at some pictures that show each approach. In this picture, we see that the teacher is the director. The teacher speaks and the students listen. Students might respond to the teacher, but interaction between students is not encouraged. Giving a lecture without interaction is one example. In this picture, we see that the students have more control over their own learning. This is more of a shared classroom experience with the teacher and students together in class but the focus is on the students and their interaction with each other. Before continuing, let's hear some of your thoughts. What are some benefits of student-centered learning? Yeah, we'd love to hear from you again, everybody. What do you think? What are some benefits that you see when you focus more on students than on the teacher in your classroom? 
I always feel that my students get a little bit more excited when I'm focusing more on them and trying to have them interact more. What about you? Hina says it's confidence building. Great. What other thoughts do you have? What are other benefits of student-centered learning? Students can work in groups and that helps with their speaking fluency. Great. Antonio says students can help one another. Students engage better. Let's see, Nell says classroom management is, in, is better that way. The class is more dynamic from Giovanni. They learn a lot more from Viveka. Miriam says they develop more fluency. And Farheen says maybe there's even faster learning. Great, a lot of great ideas sort of related to students being more engaged and motivated. So great ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Those are great ideas. Now, I think some of uh, our colleagues, some other teachers may wonder, or maybe we wonder too, within our student-centered classroom, what is the teacher's role? The classroom is student-centered, but the teacher is still actively engaged with the class. However, according to Weimer, teachers will be much more around the classroom than in front of it. There is no sense in any way, in any of the literature that I read, that this is a diminished, less essential role. Thus, the classroom arrangement may look a little bit different, but the teacher's responsibility is still the same and still important, and that is to teach. Our focus in today's webinar is on student-centered speaking activities so let's continue by defining fluency and accuracy. Here's another question for you. How would you define fluency in speaking? What do you think, everybody? How would you define fluency when it comes to speaking? We, as language teachers, we're always thinking about those four skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And in this case, in today's webinar, we're focusing on that skill of speaking. So how would you define fluency when it's related to speaking? What are some characteristics or what are some ways that you would use to describe it? Let's see, Edisham says that their pronunciation is sped up and there aren't any mistakes. Hina says speaking without errors. Let's see, Anita says the ability to use the right intonation and to have a flow of ideas. Mohammed says the ability to communicate. Monica also says being able to communicate. Kongwe says the focus on fluency means even if they make a, a mistake, that's okay. The focus is on the message. Um, Asad says to speak fearlessly. I like that idea. Great ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Those are interesting ideas. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead now and examine the word fluency in more detail. You know, many people use the word fluency every day, including people who aren't working in education like us. So people who aren't teachers may think of being fluent in a language in a different way than we teachers do. For example, how many of us have heard this? Sometimes people say, oh, I'm fluent in five languages. And then we learn that's because they can say hello in five languages, and, and that's it. Teachers would not say that person is fluent, according to the definition of fluency that's written for us language teachers. Here's an example from a book on practical English language teaching. Fluency is the capacity to speak fluidly, confidently, and at a rate consistent with the norms of the relevant native speech community, according to Bailey. Let's think about this a bit more. Is grammar connected to fluency? Here's information from another source. It states that fluency includes the ability to speak with a good, but not necessarily perfect command of intonation, vocabulary, and grammar. The key words here are good, but not necessarily perfect. Maybe the speaking is perfect, maybe it isn't. Speaking fluently is not the same as speaking accurately. Next, let's look at a definition of accuracy. 
Accuracy refers to the ability to speak properly. That is selecting the correct words and expressions to convey the intended meaning, as well as using the grammatical patterns of English. Next, let's listen. I'm going to give two short speech examples. One will be more fluent and one will be more accurate. Can you tell the difference? Here is the first example. I am very happy to be here. Here is the second example. I happy, very happy here. So please share your reaction to these sentences. Kate, you're welcome to share your reaction too. Sounds good. What do you think, everybody? Which one of these is more an example of fluency and which one is more of an example of accuracy? So which one is more fluent and which one is more accurate? Let's see, a lot of people are saying number two. I think they mean maybe that number two is more fluent. Let's see, Hina says number one is fluent, number two is accurate. A lot of people also saying number one is more accurate. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people are saying number one is accurate and number two is fluent. Is that correct, Julie? That is correct. Good job, everybody. You've got it. Mm -hmm. Let's continue then by talking more about fluency and accuracy because both are important. But some teachers ask, which is more important for our students? Well, that depends on your context. Where are you teaching? Why are your students studying English? Fluency may be more important than accuracy for some of your students. I would say though that as language teachers, we are working with our students to increase their proficiency, to increase their skill in speaking. We know that the most proficient speakers speak with both fluency and accuracy. Next, as we transition into the activities, let's take a look at some important steps in the process of planning lessons. The first step is reflection. Think about your students' speaking skills, their strengths and areas to improve. And then, if your department has a curriculum, think about that, review it, look over the list of student learning outcomes. A learning outcome is a learning goal, what your students should know after the activity or lesson. Step two is choosing general outcomes. I suggest choosing either one, two, maybe three, so that you don't have too many outcomes, which can make it difficult to reach all of them. And those outcomes will become the students' learning goals for that class. Making specific choices is the final step. Choose an activity that supports the students in reaching their learning goals, and choose a topic connected to that same learning outcome. At this point, it's time to decide where the lesson will be held. Maybe it will be in the classroom, or will you take the class outside or on an educational trip? Considering location reminds me that everyone's teaching context is different in terms of resources and classrooms of all shapes and sizes. And as a teacher myself, it's a challenge to lead speaking activities that include movement when there isn't much classroom space. I know that some teachers have very few options. I've been in some classrooms where there's only space for desks that are nailed to the floor and there's no space at the front of the classroom either. So nothing can be moved and we need to look at some ways to work around this challenge. So one option is moving to a different space if possible, another room or take the class outside or tell students to sit or stand and turn from side to side so they can speak to the classmates who are near them. In some rooms, like the lecture hall in this picture, some students can stay in the rows while others move into the aisles. This movement lets students talk to more people. 
and in some rooms, students can stand along the outside walls. The standing students talk and the sitting students listen, and then the students can switch locations and switch roles. This brings me to my next question. What are some ways that you overcome or handle challenges with classroom space that is not easy to use for speaking activities? All right, great question. What do you think, everybody? How do you manage situations where classroom space is not easy to use? What are some techniques or strategies that you do to sort of work around the problem? Monica says we can always be creative and find a solution. Great, I love it. And Maricela says outside is better. So that's great, maybe you take your students outside sometimes. Let's see, what else do you think? How can you manage situations where classroom space is not easy for you to use? What are some ways you can still use what you have and find a creative solution? Let's see, Aricelia says that they sometimes take their students outside of the classroom. Anita says she asks them to stand up and move. Let's see, Hina says that um, she takes her class to the playground. Maybe the student, you can just ask a lot of questions so the students get uh, engaged and motivated to talk more. Karima says you can turn to your partners. And a lot of other people are saying that they take their students outside the classroom. So wonderful ideas, everyone. Thanks very much for sharing. Absolutely, those are some very creative ideas. So um, next, let's return to that idea of planning topics. I've already mentioned it should be connected to students' learning outcomes, and here are some other considerations. Here you see students actively engaged in conversation. Students respond positively to tasks and topics that are interesting and authentic with a real-life connection. Their motivation increases when they can relate to the topics and connect their classroom work to real life. Also when planning, it is important to be sensitive so that everyone feels comfortable participating. For example, I never have students discuss the appearance of other students, their age, or marital status. The type of question also affects how productive conversations are. Here are two types of common questions. So Kate, I'd like to ask you to look at two example questions and tell me which is open-ended and which is close-ended. One question is, do you have a favorite holiday? And the other question is, what is your favorite holiday? Kate, what do you think? All right, well, let's see, close-ended or open-ended. I'm looking at these examples here. The first one, do you have a favorite holiday? And the other one, do you have your, what is your favorite holiday? Um, I think that the first one, do you have a favorite holiday, is close-ended because pretty much you're just asking for a one-word answer, yes or no. So I could say something like, yes, mm -hmm. and that's it. <laughs> and then there's nothing else for me to say because the question was just, do you have a favorite holiday? Whereas what is your favorite holiday kind of is more open as I'm seeing a lot of responses are saying, agreeing with me because there are many options that I can choose from and maybe I can explain which one is my favorite. Is that correct, Julie? That's 100% correct, you've got it. And you know, I really have to smile thinking about the close-ended question because I think so many teachers can relate to this. Doing an activity where we ask students, do you have a favorite holiday? And they say yes. And then the teacher, sometimes it's been me, says, well, say more, <laughs> but they actually <laughs> did answer the question already. So when we're trying to stimulate more discussion, it's definitely better to ask an open-ended question. It also encourages additional independent and critical thinking and adding why to the question, the open-ended question, creates even more discussion. So teachers, what about your classes? What is an example of an open-ended question that your students would like to answer? Great, let's hear from you everybody. What's an example of an open-ended question that your students would like to answer? So maybe something that's interesting for them. 
Farida says, open-ended questions make students think more. I definitely agree. You have, they have to kind of speak more and think of more to say with an open-ended question. What are some nice questions that you could ask your students um, and be thinking what, you know, your age, the age level of your students, their language level, all those different types of things, of course, are going to come into consideration when you pick a good question for them to get their discussions flowing and their speaking going. Maricela says you can say, how was your day? Very nice. And you can maybe ask for details about the day. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's see what else. What do you like about your English teacher from Anita? I love that one. Make sure you're ready just in case they don't have a lot to say, but I'm sure they'll have a lot of great things to say about each of you. Um, Jenny says, what did you do last weekend? That's nice. You can have your students speak about a lot of activities. Um, who is your favorite singer from Lourdes? Um, what is your comfort food? Tell us about your weekend, your family. Why would you like to travel or where would you like to go and why? Something like this. Um, tell me two positive things that happened to you today from Marco. Wonderful answers, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Those are great. I'm, I'm going to try some of those with my students. So for the rest of this webinar, everyone, I'm going to share some of my most successful speaking activities. But having said that, everyone's teaching situation is different. So please carefully, carefully select and modify these activities based on your situation and your students. I'll provide detailed instructions and some options or variations when teaching multi-level classes or working with some different types of students. All of these activities can be recycled or reused with some modification or revision. In fact, I recommend repeating activities because after students learn what to do, they can start the activity faster. Just um, for variety, you could add some different topics or have a new grammatical or vocabulary focus. So here's a question for you. How do your students react to activities involving movement? What do you think, everybody? We're going to start talking about all of the great student-centered speaking activities that Julie has for us now. And we're, the first question for you is, how do students react to involving to activities that involve movement. What do they think about them? Do they like them? Do they not like them? Do they get excited? Do they get bored? What do you think? Let's see. Aricella says they love it. They love these types of activities. Nice. I've noticed the same thing. My students really like to move. Carolina says positive. They're eager to do that. Um, Rizwan also says they love it. Adrian says they react negatively. All right, thank you for sharing. 60% enjoy it and 40% of them don't like it. They don't feel comfortable or they're scared from um, Adi Chum. They're motivated, they're excited. They seem to be bothered at first, but then they actually like it. I've definitely noticed that. Sometimes students just want to sit down and not do anything, but once they're up and moving, the smiles start to come on their faces. Great ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I can relate to what everybody said. Most of the time, my students really enjoy the movement, and um, it doesn't matter what age they are. I'm including my adult students in that. But from time to time, like some of you said, I do have some students who don't like moving so much. But even those students like the next activity that I'm going to share with you because it requires movement, but not so much movement. So this might be a good activity to start off with as an, an introductory activity for those uh, classes. So the name of our first activity is communication lines. Students of all ages and all proficiency levels enjoy this activity where they're speaking and moving. Students stand in lines and they move from asking questions to answering questions or from answering questions to asking questions. And throughout the activity, everyone experiences both roles, so their experience is complete. In the activity, the students have clearly defined roles, and that's because some students are very quiet. Their in-class speaking can be dominated by others who talk more. So by controlling when people speak, 
the quieter students have a chance to speak more. Regarding materials, the teacher does need two items, a timer and a list of questions or statements, or both, that the teacher reads to the class. So as I begin showing the communication line, there's an example with just 14 students, which may be much smaller, much smaller than your class. But later, we'll see how to use this activity with larger classes. So let's continue by looking at the steps to organize the line. First, you're going to divide the class into two groups. Then direct the students to stand across from each other, forming pairs. And they should be close enough so that they can hear each other across the line. But remind them to spread out and have a little more space so they can still hear each other. And there's an, an illustration, a picture on the next slide. Tell the class that line one students ask the question, listen carefully, and might ask um, or comment later in the discussion. The line two students are the leaders in answering the question. They have one minute or more to discuss, think about your class and decide in advance how much time is appropriate for your students. Now, please look at line two at the far right. There's a large black X. That X represents one student. We're going to go through several slides now with this picture. I'd like you to watch this student marked by the large X. That will let you see one student's movement through the activity. Now, once the students are lined up, give them instructions. You could say, Students in line one ask, what is your favorite movie and why? Students in line one repeat the question and students in line two start answering. A student in line one should not answer the question until the line two student has answered. And sometimes that means waiting while the line two student takes some time to prepare to speak. When time has passed, announced, time is up. It's time to change partners. Students in line one, stay where you are. Students in line two, take a step to your right. Great, and just before we switch to the next view, I wanna say that a lot of people are really enjoying this activity, like Carolina, Aram, Ruben, they all say, I love this activity and um, that, um, and a room has a nice modification. She uses the timer on her mobile phone, which is a great idea. Oh, yeah. All right. That is a great idea. The, the timer, the phone can take care of the timing and the teacher can take care of the leading. Yep. <laughs> so as we see here, uh, this means that there will be one extra student left at the end of line two. So that student will walk from the back of the line to the front. Reaching the front, the student steps into the first position and the activity continues with the roles remaining the same. So again, the line one student asks the question and it's the same question. What is your favorite movie and why? The line two student answers. The reason for this, the reason for asking the same question is that the students get valuable practice from repetition. Again, the students in line one stay in place the students in line two take a step to the right. And I have my class go through this three times. But after they repeat the same rules and the same question three times, you might like to change the activity a bit. So begin by telling the students to stay where they are. So they stay where they are in their lines, but their jobs change. Now the line two students ask the questions and line one students answer. So their roles, their jobs switch. Everyone practices as both the listener and the leader. When time is up, line two students move to their right. Here, the student we are focusing on has also moved to the right. The movement always happens in line two. This lets students interact with many other students for more variety. And although the line one students don't go to a new spot, they're still standing, so they're experiencing some movement. 
this illustration shows the activity as it continues. The line two students, again, take a step to the right. And here we see that they've again moved to the right. So you have an idea about how the activity works. Let's talk about the questions that students answer. They could be created by the teacher or by the students. If the students write the questions, it could be done in the same class, but it's usually best to have students create the questions in the previous class. So they write the questions in one class, turn them into the teacher, the teacher can read over the questions and put them into a logical order and then have the activity the next day. Great, yeah, we have some, some more really wonderful comments from our participants. Great. Let's see, Adit Sham says, changing partners is a great idea for changing the attention and making sure everybody is um, still engaged. Alexandria says, yes, I've used this activity very successfully, even with large groups, which we're gonna talk about even more in a minute. So thank you for that comment. I usually use this activity because there's not, even though there's not very much space in my classroom, it works well. That's from Aricella. And Monica says you can also use a toy to ask students to finish and rotate even if they can't move very much, which I think is a great idea. So thanks for those ideas, everyone. Thanks, everybody. So let's continue now by looking at the arrangement that could work for a larger class. Notice there is not one huge, huge line. Instead, you break up the students into several smaller lines. I suggest 10 students maximum per line. So that would be 10 on one line, 10 on the other for 20 total. Uh, the illustration you're looking at now shows seven students per line. And the illustration also shows just one teacher leading the entire class. Another option is to have assistants or the students themselves lead some lines. So now that you've heard the entire activity, what are some benefits of using communication lines with your students? All right, we've heard a couple of nice ideas from our participants about some ways that they um, use this, but what are some other benefits that you think this might bring to your classroom? Communication line strategy. Asma says, this is going to be very helpful to my class. And Medali says, it seems really interesting. I'm going to give it a try. That's great to hear. Let's see, Viviana says, this is a great opportunity to meet new people. I love that idea. You can use this strategy to sort of build some um, community in your classroom. Giovanni, sort of the same, along the same lines, you can use this to break the ice. Great idea. Um, let's see, Eritsam says that you can participate with different people. Mm -hmm. um, and students might gain new vocabulary and expressions from other students. That's another really good point. And they can kind of see the levels of other students. Um, and of course, the students produce more from Gio D'Angelo. And Rose says they have a nice freedom of expression. Um, and Hina says they can exchange different thoughts. So these are all really nice benefits to using communication lines with your students. We would love to see communication lines in your classroom um, in the coming days and weeks. So thanks for sharing these great ideas, everybody. Thank you. And I, I noticed some of you mentioned getting to know each other and ice breaking activities. Maybe you could even use it at a faculty meeting or a teacher's meeting. Something to think about for sure. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at how fluency is connected to this activity. Well, really the focus of this activity is on fluency because the students are expressing themselves. When I've tried including accuracy in the past, it was very difficult because the students are so highly engaged in conversation. But there are some things that could be done for accuracy. For example, after the activity, talk to the class, ask questions about what they said, and check for accuracy at that time. Another option is to review with a sentence frame. Here's how it works. First, write a sentence on the board and ask the class to complete it. Direct students to say the words on the board as they are written. Fill in the blanks with the correct choice. So here's an example of a sentence frame. My favorite person is blank because blank. 
students can answer, my favorite person is my best friend because he is fun. Or my favorite person is my aunt because she is interesting. So students speak to support it through the frame of the sentence and they also have some choice which gives some freedom of expression too. So this sentence frame activity focuses on accuracy. It's completed at a pace that's a bit slower so students have time to think through it and the teacher does provide with the level of choosing to move or not read the sentences, but they can listen and fill in the blank. Now let's move on to an impromptu speaking activity, our next activity. And this is speaking that is unplanned or relatively unplanned. This is a very popular activity that my colleagues and I have developed and revised and used in many ways with our students. So let's begin with a definition. Impromptu speaking is sudden speaking with little or no preparation time. It's fast. Practicing impromptu speaking helps our students develop skills that they can use anytime someone asks a question. It helps them to think quickly on their feet. So everybody, why is impromptu speaking a positive addition to the English as a foreign language or EFL classroom? How can students benefit? All right, everybody, thank you for sharing that definition of impromptu speaking as sort of speaking without planning too much. Um, what do you think, everybody? Why is impromptu speaking a positive part of classroom activities in our classrooms, in English as a foreign language classrooms? What do you think? How can it benefit students? I think it might benefit students because it's more similar to real life. We had some people saying that in our first webinar. What do you think? More participation from Edith Shum. It's more real from Zafar Ali. Very nice. Let's see. They can use their learned language in more creative ways. Check. You can check their level and their understanding from Aruj. Very good idea because you can sort of see where they're at in a more real life situation. A lot of people saying it's sort of similar to a real life situation like Lourdes. Let's see, Fatima also said that. Rose says it causes students to be quick thinkers. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. um, very good, great ideas everybody. Yeah, I agree, those are good points everyone, thank you. Uh, I'll add that for my students, they also like this impromptu speaking practice because they're preparing to take standardized tests of their English skills, and that is included as a test section. So they like to practice in small groups, get ready for the test, and practice with peers who understand their situation, practicing a skill that they also use in our classroom every day. Now, regarding materials, each group needs two items, a timer and questions to answer in their group. Uh, I write the questions on an index card or small pieces of paper. This helps students to focus on each question. But I've learned, don't give them one piece of paper with all of the activities questions, because then they might read all of the questions before answering them. So let's discuss the questions that the students answer. First, if all of the students are at the same proficiency level, all of the questions can be at that level. So you'd have one index card with one question, another index card with another question. But for the multi-level classes, it's great to give students the opportunity to choose the level of difficulty for their question. So let's look at this variation now. Write or type the questions on an index card, one index card, or a separate piece of paper. For the question card, write questions at three levels of difficulty on the same topic. The student reads the questions and very quickly chooses one to answer. So the student chooses the question's level of difficulty. Here's one example of a question card. One, how does a good English teacher talk to students? Two, what are the characteristics of a good English teacher? Three, to what extent 
do you agree that a good English teacher should be extroverted or outgoing? Why? You see the questions become more difficult and the first question is easier than the third question. To find questions, I create my own or look online. Sometimes I use uh, questions from the free test preparation web pages of the English standardized tests my students take. And then when your materials are ready, it's time to start the lesson. So tell students to sit in a group of four in a circle and choose a role. The group can decide everyone's role. Here we see the four choices are speaker, timer, listener one, and listener two. And the best group size for my students is four. Some teachers prefer having five students per group. That would result in three listeners or two listeners and an encourager. Let's follow these steps. First, the speaker reads the question from the question card. The timer says you have one minute to prepare starting now and starts the clock. The speaker can write notes and use them when speaking. After one minute, the timer says, prep time has ended, please begin speaking. Step four, the timer starts the clock again. The speaker speaks for one and a half to two minutes. The group listens carefully to the speaker. They can take notes if they wish, and they should definitely use body language nodding and smiling to show that they're interested. After two minutes, even if the speaker is still talking, the timer says, that is two minutes, time is up, thank you. Regarding feedback, the teacher can choose how to handle that. Everybody in class should follow the same style. Here are three options that I've used, starting with the first option, which is no feedback, to the third, which is the most complete. So in number one, students listen in the group, but they do not provide feedback. The next option is that the listeners and timer make only positive comments. They include what they heard and saw, such as posture and body language. This reinforces the good work that students are already doing. The third option is to give constructive criticism. Both listeners and the timer comment on the speaking giving one strength and one area to improve. Feedback is limited maybe to about 30 seconds, not too short, not too long. The speaker can ask questions to check that they understand the feedback. Then the activity continues by selecting a new speaker. So on the slide, we see the first speaker is now listener number two. And the activity continues with the speaker preparing speaking and receiving feedback. And then immediately after answering one question, a new speaker is selected. This activity continues as long as the teacher would like. Now let's discuss how the teacher can listen to the students work in small groups while being less intrusive, less noticeable. Great. Yeah, and I just wanna have a couple, just a couple comments from the audience that Umberto says te the teacher should also exemplified teaching with respect and confidence to students, which I think is a great point. Thanks so much. And M. Teresa says, I love activities with roles. It's so productive for students. And others who are also saying that um, they, they love this activity. And Aricela says, feedback is very important for students to improve. So thanks for sharing ideas about feedback. All right, let's continue with our less intrusive options. Wonderful, thanks. So the reason that I've included this today is that it's important for our students to feel free to experiment with language. It's fine for us to listen, but we don't always want to correct them. So in my classroom pictures, I'm showing two examples of listening that teachers can do that are less noticeable. And you can see I'm standing in one picture and kneeling in the other. Here are the steps to follow. First, carry some paper and pen with you, and then move behind the students so they continue talking. If you stand in front, students often establish eye contact with you and, and start talking to you instead of each other. Stand or kneel behind the students, and then make your own notes. Write down some mistakes 
you'd like to review or teach in a future class. You're doing data collection here. This is not the time to correct mistakes at all. Um, when you do talk about ways that students can improve their speaking, don't tell the class the names of the students who made the mistakes. So this activity includes fluency because it asks students to answer questions smoothly. And in terms of accuracy, um, there are many points related to that. One is that the listeners can provide information on accuracy. Um, teachers can have both listeners focus on different aspects of accuracy. Listener one can comment on grammar. Listener two can comment on word choice and pronunciation. There's some flexibility there. And next I'd like to share an activity that allows students to use their own language samples to evaluate their speaking. Great, we have some um, comments. Let's see, John Dopp says that listening, listening patiently is an art, definitely, one that many of us have to learn as teachers. And Ruben says, this is my first time to see this kind of activity. I would love to use it in my class. So thanks for your comments, everyone. Oh, that's wonderful. So the next activity is called Analysis Through Transcription. And this is a great opportunity for self-evaluation. So in class, each student records at least one sample of their speaking on their cell phone. It can be a short sample or a long one. They listen to their recording after class and type or write what they hear. Writing is the transcription. And then the students analyze their fluency and accuracy. The steps that they follow are first, the teacher explains the activity to the students. Choose a 30 to 45 second section of your speaking that was difficult or where you were unsure of your accuracy. Write or type everything you hear. Make a copy of that writing. Using the copy, correct any mistakes. Don't change the content, don't change the information, just fix the mistakes. Underline, circle, and or highlight the mistakes and corrections and turn it into the teacher who will review it. So when the teacher receives all of these students' papers, the teacher reads through each transcription carefully, checking that mistakes have been corrected. If the teacher finds a mistake that was not corrected, the teacher circles it and writes the correction. Then the teacher returns the papers to the students and asks the students to look for the mistakes that were circled and corrected. You might say, these are mistakes that you missed. Think about why you missed them. The reason is, if a student makes a mistake in speaking and again makes the same mistake on the transcription, when they have time to think about it outside of class. Maybe it shows that the student doesn't know the information. Maybe they've never learned it or they benefit from a review. So let's continue on to another activity. As mentioned earlier, the most proficient speakers speak with both fluency and accuracy. And giving a presentation requires both. So, as students' skills improve, teachers tend to give longer and longer presentations. Those can take up a large amount of class time. So with this particular activity called the elevator pitch presentation, teachers have an option for a shorter yet still challenging presentation. And this elevator pitch presentation is known for its short length and persuasive style. It works well with more proficient students at an intermediate or advanced level. And students who are a bit older benefit from and enjoy this activity, especially students in middle school and high school and adults. So what is an elevator pitch? It's a short speech and it successfully delivers a sales pitch. So the idea is in the time it takes for an elevator to travel from the first floor up to the top floor of a building, a business person could convince a possible future client to buy their product. This type of uh, speaking started in the business world and then entered higher education. So imagine a business person riding in an elevator with a possible prospective client. That's how much time the business person has to describe their product. Regarding materials, the timer is used 
and also assignment guidelines, which are given to every student uh, by the teacher, whether they are spoken or written directions. So here are the steps. First, tell the class that they will present an elevator pitch. Provide background, including the definition and explanation of an elevator pitch. Then watch some videos together in class and discuss them. Stress that the speaking should not be too fast. An easy way to find videos is to search online using the words elevator pitch competitions. There are many videos online uh, of these real life competitions being held at business schools. But I'll tell you, some people speak so quickly that I can't catch all of their ideas. So this can lead to a good discussion with your class about remembering the audience. Speak at a pace that is slow enough for the audience to understand what you're saying. Then discuss the assignment guidelines. So include the length of the presentation. Now, depending on your students, this could be anywhere from two to three and a half minutes. Also include a general topic and a rubric. That is a form for grading that students can use as a guide to make sure that they're meeting expectations. Then give students some time to prepare, at least a few days. Next, consider having an in-class review session where your students can present to a small group of peers and receive feedback from them. Then, at the next class, students present. The teacher times each presentation and makes grading notes. One option is filming the presentations and students can review their presentations later by watching the film. And now we see some possible topics for this presentation. A student could sell a product, such as a car or a set of luggage. They could sell a service, such as a house cleaning service. You could use a general topic that also allows for some choice, such as, if I had a million dollars, I'd buy. And that provides some connection. Everybody in the class has the same general topic but moves in different directions with their final choice. So let's look at some variations. One way to change the activity is to keep the length of the elevator pitch, but expand the topic, expand it to any persuasive topic, such as the reasons why a certain neighborhood is the best. If desired, this presentation can include gamification, which means adding an element, just like a game has. So students could vote at the end of the activity. They could vote on the most interesting speech, the most fluent speech, or the most accurate speech, and share their vote by secret ballot. So this presentation focuses on speaking that communicates ideas smoothly and confidently, words that match the fluency definition from this webinar. This presentation also includes accuracy as speakers try to use their most correct English skills to communicate with their audience and persuade them. So that ends our look at elevator pitches. And now I'd like to share some additional resources with you, even more speaking activities. So after this presentation, more resources for student-centered speaking activities will be on the Ning resource page for this session. There's also a link to the American English AE website. And please look for my article published in English Teaching Forum. The article outlines a three-week unit ending with a presentation that evaluates student skills in both speaking fluency and accuracy. And this brings me to our final question for this session. Of all the activities described today, which one do you think would be most popular with your students and why? What do you think, everybody? We had a lot of great activities that were shared today. Communication lines, impromptu speaking, and elevator pitch presentations. Which one do you like the best or which one do you think your students would like the best? Please let us know. Let's see, Edith Sham says communication lines. Let's see, what other ideas do you think you might want to use in your classroom? I saw some comments earlier that people had never seen the impromptu speaking. I think I mentioned that, so they were going to try that. 
the lines from Reese Wan. Communicate. Tanya says communication lines. Um, let's see. A lot of people are saying communication lines. Hina, AIR says impromptu speaking. Let's see. The elevator pitch is something that M. Teresa is going to use. And a lot of people saying communication lines. Great. Well, that's great. Thanks, everyone. And before we conclude, I'd like to invite you to connect with me via social media. I'd love to hear how the activities work with your students or see a picture. Let me know how it goes. In conclusion, I wish you well in your teaching, in your teaching and speaking, and all of your teaching, whatever the context, wherever you are. As a teacher, you make a difference. Thank you very much for participating today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Julie, for that wonderful presentation on student-centered speaking activities. I think we all got a lot of great ideas for things that we can use in our classroom to help our students improve both their fluency and their accuracy in um, speaking in our classrooms and outside in the real world as well. So thank you so much for those great ideas.